We began a series last week on stewarding well what God has entrusted to us. And last week we looked at time, how God has entrusted time to us, time in our days, time in our weeks, time in our years, time across our lives. And we looked from Psalm 90 last week at, uh, at that and we reflected on what it means to steward our time wisely and well. But our time is not our own. But indeed, our time has been entrusted to us by God and the importance of uh, stewarding that well. And so we continue this series. Uh, we're, we're looking at many and varied things over these weeks that um, God has entrusted to us. And today we're going to look at from Psalm 8 uh, that Dorothy read right at the start of the service. Uh, this, this psalm that declares the majesty of God. And we're going to look at the importance of stewarding wisely and well, not just our time, but stewarding God's creation, the natural world that, that we live in. Often on a Saturday, you'll find me down at our local community football club. I'm uh, in the role as a chaplain there, and uh, I was there for a fair chunk of yesterday, and uh, through the autumn and, and winter months, through football season, uh, quite often uh, my Saturdays are spent uh, engaging with people and uh, playing various parts uh, as a part of the, uh, the football club in our local community. But at the football, you hear a lot of different voices. And you hear a lot of different voices coming from a whole lot of different places. In conversations that are held, but uh, broad, broader than that, uh, uh, people who are watching and engaging with the game that's going on. It seems to me that when it comes to creation and when it comes to the natural world that we live in, there are many different voices too that can come from a whole lot of different places. Today we're simply going to look at what God shows us in the Bible about creation and the natural world. We're going to look at things from a biblical and a theological perspective. That is the lens that God gives us to, to view all things in life through, not just this area, but everything in life. Sadly, though, when it comes to stewarding well God's creation, the secular voices seem to be heard more than the Christian ones. But when we understand what the Bible teaches about stewarding God's creation, we should be leading the way as followers of Jesus in stewarding what God has entrusted to us in his creation. We shouldn't be lagging behind other voices that may not even acknowledge the God of creation. We who know the God of creation, who know the creator and the, and the savior and the redeemer for ourselves should be leading the way in, uh, in, in understanding what it means to steward well God's creation. So let's turn to Psalm 8 and let's see what God shows us here along with other parts of the Bible from beginning to end about stewarding the, the natural world, the created world that God has entrusted to us. And the first thing that we are reminded of from Psalm 8 is that creation reveals the majesty of God. Let me read those verses again to you that the psalm starts with. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the, the, through the praise of children and infants, you've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? And the verse 9 at the end of the psalm repeats what the psalm begins with. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Whether it's the heavens, as the psalm writer focuses in on particularly here, or God's handiwork displayed in all the earth, as verse 1 says. Creation points us to the creator God. And it points us to the majesty and the wonder of our creator God. Romans uh, chapter 1 verse 20 puts it like this when it comes to the world that we live in. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, been understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Creation itself declares the majesty and the wonder of God. Creation itself points people to the wonder of God. In John Ertberg, on John Ortberg's book, God is Closer Than You Think, he writes this. I've been asked by some how I can be so certain in the existence of God. 
And I have asked them in return if they have eyes to see. God has woven himself irretrievably into nature, left his fingerprints behind to show us where he's been. His signature is smeared into the curls of the Milky Way. God is crying out all around us. In the sunrise and sunsets across land and sea and sky, they all point to our creator God. No jagged mountain throws its sharp weight against the sky that is not a testament to his goodness. The entire sum of creation, each individual act of nature, is God waving hello. The beauty and the diversity of creation reveals the majesty of God. And, and that is why we are not to worship creation in itself, but we are to it is simply pointing us to the creator God whom we are to worship. In the light of creation revealing the majesty of God, can I encourage you to live in ways that enjoy God's creation? There's so much of God's creation to enjoy. There's so much to take in around us of the majesty and wonder of God. And that doesn't have to be in complicated ways or, or ways that involve us uh, st stepping right out of our everyday lives. You, you ca that can be in the garden, that can be on a walk, that can be at the beach, just to name a few very simple ways in which you can enjoy God's creation around you without having to take a three-hour hike uh, <laughs> a bit further afield. Make sure that you're taking time to enjoy God's creation. And, and, and not only to enjoy it, but as you enjoy it, to reflect on the wonder and the majesty of, the, of our creator God. As we read on in Psalm 8, though, into verses 6 to 8, we see that caring for God's creation is our God-given responsibility. Verses 6 to 8. You made them rulers, that, that, that's people, over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. To understand most fully how God has entrusted his creation to us, we need to go back to Genesis and we need to go back to the Garden of Eden. Uh, Genesis chapter 2 uh, describes for us uh, right at the start of the Bible or very early on from verse 8 in Genesis chapter 2 uh, let me read to you from verse 8 now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden and there he put the man he had formed the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food in the middle of the garden were the, uh, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil a river watering the garden flowed from Eden from there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Here's the natural resources being described as well. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Coming to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To work it and to take care of it. To work it and to take care of it, it says. Now the words in the original language are important, very important to understand here. The word translated work, to work it or elsewhere to rule over it, is the Hebrew word for serve. While the word translated take care, in the original language, means to keep, to guard, to watch over, and to protect. In other words, as people entrusted by God with his creation, we are not to rule over it as if it was ours to do with what we want, but we are to take care of it under God as servants, not as masters of it. We honour God, among other ways, by how we care for his creation. One of our values as a church includes that, that, amongst other things, we care for all God has made. I guess you could uh, use the illustration of uh, saying, well, um, it's impossible to say that you love Rembrandt and yet not look after one of his paintings. Now, I don't have one of Rembrandt's paintings. <laughs> of course I don't, but you get the point. We can't say that we love God and then neglect or, worse still, destroy his, his creation. So what kind of a steward? Are you being when it comes to God's creation? It's all of our God-given responsibilities to care for God's creation. 
Can I encourage you to live in ways that's, that uh, actively engage with caring for God's creation? Again, there are many simple ways to do that. Reducing the amount of waste you consume or the energy you use. Reusing things rather than simply using and replacing. Recycling in greater ways. Respecting the work of God's hands in increased ways, as the psalm writer puts it, just to name a few. And just one example of that uh, coming out of Psalm 8. Psalm 8 describes um, uh, the flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sea. And then it mentions uh, the fish in the sea and, and it reinforces that with all that swim the paths of the sea. So the seas get mentioned twice in Psalm 8. Think about our seas with me for a moment. One example of respecting the work of God's hands comes out of verse 8. The fish of the sea and all that swim the path of the sea. But if you know anything at all about what's going on in, in, in the seas and the oceans, huge amounts of plastic waste in our seas choke and destroy the habitat of much that swim the path of the seas in these times that we live in. And worse still, they choke and destroy many sea creatures themselves. Major part, and that's just one example, major parts of God's creation that are there to reveal the majesty of God are not flourishing. Far from it. They are floundering. And that's why it's important that as those given responsibility of caring for God's creation in the natural world and ruling over it in a responsible way, we play our part, small and significant, in caring for God's creation in whatever way we are able to. God's creation reveals the majesty of God. Caring for creation is our God-given responsibility. But thirdly and finally today, God will redeem his creation. In Romans chapter 8, we read this, where it describes uh, from verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. God created this world, and God created everything in it as good and perfect. But as sin came into the world, as, as, as we read in the early chapters of Genesis, as sin came into the world, as men and women chose to step outside of God's best for them and live independently of God rather than dependent of God, to live outside of, 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 of the boundaries that God had given to them, it not only affected our relationship with God, but it affected every part of life in this world. What was good became damaged. What was, dam what was good became damaged goods, subject to decay and destruction. That's true of life in this world as a whole, and it's true of God's creation too. But the good news is that, as Paul says here, God will redeem what's not as it should be. Now, God's redeeming and restoring work is centered above all on us as people, being brought back into right relationship with him. But as Romans makes clear, it encompasses all of creation too. And uh, the book of Colossians, in chapter 1, verse 20, reinforces that, where it says, Through him, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwelling him, and through him to reconcile or redeem to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. God will one day make all things new. A glorious day when all will be put right and what it was like in the Garden of Eden will be restored as life as a whole. People will be in, in, in right and perfect relationship with God, serving God and worshipping God in all of the wonder that, that, that God is worthy of as God created us for. But, but beyond that and, and uh, in, a whole, in a whole way Everything will be made new. Can I encourage you today to live expectantly, looking forward with expectation to that day when God's redemption of, of, of not only us as people, but God's redemption of all of creation is complete. That's described beautifully in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21, the first five verses. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
The first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and he will, and God himself will, will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. In the doom and gloom of what happens in life in this world, including in God's creation, there is hope to be found in God's redeeming purposes. The wonder of God, the wonder of God's creation, the wonder of God's redeeming purposes. In the meantime, in the here and now, may we each play our part in stewarding well and wisely what God has entrusted to us with our time, as we looked at last week, but in God's creation as well. Next week, we'll go on to look at uh, how we steward uh, the, the, the talents and abilities and gifts that God has given us. The week after, we'll look at how we steward wisely and well the financial resources that God has entrusted to us. And then the week after, we'll look at what it means to steward our lives as a whole under God. Let me lead you in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that you are an amazing God. You are steadfast in your love. You are abundant in your mercy. You are wise in your actions. You are a wonderful creator God who has provided a magnificent creation that both reveals your majesty but also provides abundant resource, you have provided abundant resources for us to enjoy. You've also placed the care of your creation within our care. And you call us to steward your created world wisely and well, responsibly and respectfully. Thank you that you're also a God of redemption, though, both of us, of people, and of your creation. Despite sin and its effects damaging uh, so much of life in this world, we can have confidence in you. We can have confidence in your redeeming work to, to complete and make whole uh, the, the fulfilling of your purposes of restoration, of renewal, of redemption. God, you truly are an amazing, wonderful God. We want to honour you. We want to glorify you in every aspect of our lives in this world. Teach us more of what that means. Help us to do that wisely and well, we ask so that, above all, we would glorify you in our lives. And we ask this in and through the name of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord of all, in whose name we pray. Amen.